and I can't tell you how good it is to be back in the United States. So, Yakwe, Sabadiman. In a Marshallese, that means greetings with love and happy Sabbath. So, my wife and I consider it a real honor and a privilege to stand here before you, and I humbly have this opportunity to share God's word. So, we all know God is good, isn't He? God is good all the time. And I'll tell you what, they do that a lot in the Marshallese church. Would you pray with me, please? God, thank you so much as we approach your word. We ask for the help of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, that you would help us to see Jesus, to experience Jesus, to see him in his beauty and in his majesty. Thank you for your grace and the moments that we share now. God, I pray with all my heart that your blessed words would reach the hearts of the congregation that may know your name, to better understand your love, that your words inspire those in our congregation that know your love to more boldly share your love. And finally, those that follow in your steps will be stronger to help those that may be weak, yet follow behind them. In Jesus' name, amen. And I said it's so good to be back home, back with our church family, back with our daughter and our son and our daughter in Chicago. Uh, during our mission, we experienced a true lesson of how fragile life really is, but also how beautiful life is and what life God has put here for us. The world that many rarely can see. Not a world that you visit on vacation where everything is proper and in place, but a world that really is unpretentious, with fault, unforgiving, difficult, challenging, yet with beauty to behold when we tear away Satan's curtain and we let God's light in. When we arrived, we would experience total immersion, Bible study twice a week, fellowship and worship every morning before school, student missionary church on Wednesday night, Friday night vespers, I miss them. Sabbath morning church, afternoon potluck, and fellowship. And then Sabbath evening, we had church with the youth. So we were always, always in Christ's word. We were blessed to experience a world that was open to God's love when there was those willing to show and share exactly what God's love was through the intent and action. A world of rough edges that was simply waiting for someone to show God's love and soften the edge on life. I truly thank God for sending us into the unknown so that we could share the love of a true almighty God that is as powerful and alive today as he was the first six days of creation. Today we will talk about Jesus and Jesus' love for us. I want to talk about when we follow Jesus that it's really about his love for us. It's not about our love for him. So, if you want to follow me in the Bible, we'll go to Matthew 28, 16 through 20, and that's where I'm going to focus some of my talk. We're going to talk about the Great Commission. I know that all of you know what that Great Commission is, but I'm going to share it probably in a little different viewpoint. In 16, chapter. In uh, 16, verse 16, then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And boy, that makes me feel good. Now, as we come to this passage today, I believe that it's, it's good that we bring no preconceptions about what this great commission says. So we need to simply listen to what Jesus says and what he commands, lest we think that we already know what he's saying and we miss, in fact, what he truly wants us to know. In fact, today I'm going to propose to you that this message is primarily about discipleship. I believe that much of the Gospel of Matthew is devoted to providing a manual for the study of Christian and for Christian disciples. 
And there's a tremendous theme running throughout the Gospel of Matthew about Christian discipleship. And it tells us about the priority of discipleship, the primacy and discipleship in its mission with the church, and it also tells us about the practice of discipleship and how you're supposed to do it. It's wholly appropriate that we come to God's Word and we learn something of Jesus' own outline of what discipleship ought to look like. So on this beautiful Sabbath morning, we're going to look at two parts of this passage. I'd like to look at verse 16 and 17 first. And in the first section of the passage, we see a description of the disciples obediently going to Galilee and a picture of the disciples, and they're still struggling with their faith. Then if we look at verses 18 through 20, we see Jesus declaring his authority. We see Jesus giving a command. And we see Jesus issuing a comforting encouragement and a promise to the disciples. And so I'd like to look at these two parts of the passage with you today. And the first deals with the disciples' obedience and their continuing doubt. And as we look at verse 16 and 17, the last picture that Matthew gives us of this church in his gospel, he's emphasizing the missions to the Gentiles and the worship of Christ and the weakness of the disciples. And look at the first part of verse 16, and we're told that the 11 disciples obediently made their way to Galilee. It was where their ministry had begun, and by calling them back to Galilee, I want to suggest to you that even in that action, Jesus is emphasizing the worldwide mission that he's calling them to do. He's calling them to a mission to the Gentiles. They're not simply going to minister to the Jews. So, okay, he's inaugurating and he's explicitly talking about a worldwide mission. And so Matthew is emphasizing for us here the Gentile mission. Even in this last picture he gives us of the church. Then if you look at the second half of verse 16, Matthew, you'll note, he specifically mentions a mountain. Now, it may well be that Matthew is telling us here that Jesus issued this great commission from the same mountain at which he first commissioned his disciples into service. Jesus speaks to his disciples at this mountain in Galilee, and he gives them a worldwide mission as part of this new covenant. If you look at the beginning of verse 17, you'll see the disciples' response. Now, when they see Jesus, they instinctively worship. They worshiped him with all of their being. Now, Matthew's telling us something there. They are good, intelligent, well-versed in the Scripture, Orthodox Jews. And they know above all else this one principle of religion. And that is, is that you worship one and only one true God. You worship nothing else. It's their first commandment. Matthew is leaving you this impression of these 11 consecrated Orthodox Jews on their face before the Lord Jesus Christ so that you're going to know there was no doubt in their mind that this was God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the deity of Lord Jesus Christ is at the center of the Gospels. If you rip that out of the Gospels, you've got nothing left. So we're not going to make him into a moral teacher. It just doesn't work. Matthew testifies to the deity of Christ. Now, in verse 17, you see Matthew tells us something astonishing. Matthew is telling us that in order to indicate the weakness of the disciples, they continue to struggle in their quest to believe and to understand. Now, why would he mention this? Because he's going to tell you in the next breath what this source of faith and doubt is. Because he knows that the Great Commission is going to be given to these disciples in a few moments. And if you think that they were able to carry out that Great Commission on their own strength, he wants to eradicate any such misconception from your mind by telling you that even at this point, even after the resurrection, even after they've seen the Lord Jesus Christ, there were still some who were still doubtful in state. And it won't be until Pentecost that even the, that the 11 finally are over any of that doubt. Now it reminds us that the commission which Jesus gives in this passage cannot be done in human strength. We cannot do it. It must be done wholly and only in the strength of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the last two actions of the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ are worship and doubt. And that speaks volumes to our generation. You know, we may think that we're the first generation to struggle with doubt. And Matthew is simply saying, hey, look, I'm 2,000 years ahead of you. 
We doubted back then. You're not the first generation to even struggle with it. We had many, many, many generations ahead of you. If you come as a Christian struggling with issues and doubt, Matthew is simply telling you, I know what it's like to watch a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ struggle. It's not a pretty thing, but I understand it, and I know how to deal with it, and I know how to cure it. The second thing we're going to focus on is Jesus' declaration of authority, his command, and his encouragement to the disciples. There are many doubting Christians in the world today that are looking for an answer to their doubt in mystical encounters, miracles, signs, wonders. And here's Matthew telling you, do you have doubts? Your solution to those doubts is in the word of Christ. That's where doubt vanishes. Christ comes and he speaks his word. And in verse 18, you see the claim that he makes. He says that all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And if you want to be in heaven with him, it must happen on his terms. The Lord Jesus is saying to his disciples, all authority belongs to me. Now, it's important that these disciples understand that because he's about to ask these 11 trembling men to become the foundation of a worldwide movement that will end up causing the nations to bow the knee before him and to profess him as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Matter of fact, let me in fact say that one more time so that I rem you guys all remember this correctly with me. These 11 trembling men become the foundation of a worldwide movement that caused the nations to bow their knee before him and to profess him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And boy, I say amen to that. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen. Yeah, you bet. And then there's this command. It includes one imperative to the disciples. The three elements are going, baptizing, and teaching. The going and the baptizing and the teaching, that's how you make disciples. The imperative is what Jesus wants the church to do until he comes again. Make disciples. Jesus wants you to make them by going and baptizing and teaching. So, first of all, let's talk about the going. That's where we get world missions. Notice he says going to the nations. The point is to go to the peoples, the nations, the tongues, and the tribes. Cross every boundary of every nation and the people and the tongue and the tribes and take the gospel there. That's where the mission fits in. The goal of missions is to get people to profess faith in Christ and to make those people disciples. In evangelism and missions, we must not stop short of the goal that God has given us in the Great Commission. We're satisfied when somebody makes a profession of faith. Jesus is not. Jesus wants disciples. He doesn't want people who just makes a profession of faith. He wants disciples of Christ. Why? Because mission is a means to an end. What's our great end in life? It's to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. It's to worship Him. We want everybody to worship God and everybody to be caught up in the eternal worship of heaven forever and ever. We want them to be disciples. And so we go to the ends of the earth and we make disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So going, that's the first thing. So the second thing we'll talk about is baptizing. By baptizing, he reminds us that discipleship cannot happen without a communion of the saints. You can't be a disciple as a lone ranger. You gotta be a part of the body of Christ. Baptism is a symbol of our union with Christ and the forgiveness of our sins and our reception of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is by immersion in water and it's contingent on the affirmation of faith in Jesus and the evidence of the repentance of sin. But he doesn't stop there. He also wants us to teach them. He says by teaching them, we notice two things about this interesting command. When we teach them, he wants us to be transformed in our living by the truth. And so he says, teach them to observe. And notice he says, teach them to observe all that I have commanded. All that I have commanded. Discipleship, you see, is more than getting to know what the teacher knows. It is being like Christ. Yes, it's being a Christian. So if you can, go with me to Matthew 7, verse 21. Matthew 7, verse 21. 
Not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants them to do. What does your heart tell you to do? If God controls your heart, then he controls that direction. Being a disciple of Jesus doesn't mean agreeing with Jesus or heading the same direction as Jesus. We're not called to follow Jesus in the abstract. We're not negotiating a contract because we agree simply in principle. The call to Jesus is to Christ himself. We are called into a relationship. We follow and obey the person, the only begotten son, the author and the protector of our faith. Jesus calls us to a level of intimacy that can only be sustained by his constant presence in our life. We may not understand all that his discipleship involves or what it will cost, and I can truly tell you that. But Jesus calls us to take this first step, and through that step, we gain the necessary confidence so that we can take the next. When Michelle and I received the call to comprehensively and absolutely walk away from the things that society made us believe were very important, and boy, society makes you believe there's a lot of stuff that's important that isn't. To follow him down this exclusive path through the narrow gate to his kingdom, for us, the step was a huge beginning. Here's the focus of my belief I want to share with you this morning. Following Jesus is more about his love for you than your love for him. That's where we're going to work from. So let's try and put our minds into this idea. Following Jesus is more about his love for you. This incredible book, the Bible, guides our life, and it's filled with story after story of God's love for all of his people. So in August 2013, while at home, I sit in front of a computer. It's early in the morning. Michelle's at work. I sat, and I began to take inventory on what retirement really was all about, even though I'd been retired for seven years. Michelle and I traveled throughout the world. Our children were grown. They had started their own lives, their own careers. We had a beautiful home, nice cars, a great deal of things, actually a lot of things that we didn't even need. The Lord had really blessed us with everything, at least I thought. But for some reasons on this morning, I began to ask myself, what's this really what the Lord wants from me? He has given me everything, but what have I really given him? I knew God loved me, my family, my wonderful wife. I knew God knew that I loved him. Yet I felt him telling me it was time to go to work for him. So when my wife came home from work that evening, I told her that I had spent the day on the computer trying to see if there was some place, some volunteer organization that we could go help out. We could do go donate some of our time. We talked a little bit about this and settled for the night, and during the next week, God brought me to thinking about helping someone with some of my time to actually giving everything to the Lord and following his direction. Within a month, we had contacted a friend who I had talk, hadn't talked with for some time, only to find out that he was now the director of volunteer ministries at the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and he told me that my phone call was the work of the Lord because he truly needed us in the role as missionaries right then. Within a month, we had decided to sell our home of 25 years, give away most of our furniture and our belongings, and trusted where the Lord would lead us. Now, my wife's father is a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, and he's a chaplain. And when she was young, they were missionaries in Hawaii. Now, this is back in the Hawaii of old. Michelle had experienced this as a young child, and she knew what it meant for the family to commit to the Lord's call. And her response was, let's follow the Lord's call. Within the next year, we would fill a supply container, build a communications network for the school, develop programs, improve the school, obtain accreditation, teach pre-K, teach English to some of the most beautiful children and intelligent young people we would ever meet, and establish an emergency paramedic program for the country, and much, much more. All of this, not from us, but through the love and the guidance of our great Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I can tell you that many times Satan attacked us. Oh, and you truly know when you're doing the work of God when Satan's attacking you. But I can also tell you that when that happened, Christ would give us the strength to overcome. So, we want to take a quick minute here to thank this church and this family because you all were the collection point. You, you were closing down your fellowship hall to store its contents as they were collected. 
He provided the manpower that picked up the supplies and packed it in the container with all that you did and all that you donated. And finally, we want to thank you just for being the true family that you supported us. Now, while on mission, we also fought some battles. Some of these battles involved spiders that were bigger, ask Michelle, than the size of my hand, because one of them came into our bedroom, and cockroaches the size of small birds that flew with more precision and determination. The Lord blessed the DeLapp and SD, uh, Laura SDA schools with his bountiful love, and trust me, you'd certainly be amazed. Our travel to Majuro was all about God. He led us there, our work on the communications radio, it was all about God because he placed it there. The container full of supplies, it wasn't about us. It wasn't about us or the multitudes of other churches that helped. The container, which should have been direct from Long Beach to Guam to Majuro and take one month, instead went from Guam down to New Zealand, then up to Fiji, and finally over our, to our school, taking three months. Believe me when I say that the school students, parents, and the church praying and the container arrived when the school had utilized the last of our supplies. We had nothing left. Satan's attempt to stop the container only resulted in a stronger faith that God would prevail. Amen. Now the container made it there because it's a story about God, and it's a story about his miracles and his love for each of us. The school had a team of 24 missionaries, 24 strong, which turned out to be the strongest team that was ever assembled at that school in all the years that the church members and the parents there could ever remember. We created the largest computer and science lab on the island, bigger than the community college or the University of the South Pacific. We instituted new tutoring programs, behavior and math programs. We brought in physics, biology, accounting, chemistry. We brought in programs that are non-existent at other schools. We completed the Iowa testing. We completed the government testing. This school, we reached full accreditation. It never had before, and that's accreditation through the United States. We also attained government charter that had never existed. Now, none of this is because of the actions of us. See, God loves us so much, and he gives us spiritual gifts, and then he sits back and he sees how we use them. He gives us this choice. So these stories are all about God because he brought us there. He used those who love him dearly to be his hands, his feet, his voice, and most of all, to be his servants of love. As a matter of fact, there are so many more stories involved with each of these events that once aware of them, you can only believe without question that God made it all happen because he loves us so much. But you see, the true power of discipleship is in the story. I had an individual tell me when we were done how much they had done to make one of these projects happen. And my response was, you need to search your heart and see that what we did was very little and what God did was everything. The extraordinary emotion, love, and sacrifice God has towards us is truly incomprehensible. So let's talk shortly about Peter the disciple before we finish. You remember Peter, the disciple who gets most of the airtime of the twelve. Remember when Jesus fills Peter's boat with a pile of fish, so much the boat, the boat's starting to sink. And Peter's response, God, you have to go. You can't fill my boat with blessing because I can't live up to this. Peter understood that socially in a relationship, the relationship is two-way. If we're going to have a relationship, you have to hold up your end of the relationship. So when God fills Peter's boat and Peter recognizes, I can't keep up with my end of the relationship, what's his response? I'm a sinful man. Please go and leave me alone. I can't do this. But that was never the gospel. Never Jesus' mission. God understood that humanity cannot hold up its end of the relationship. So he sent his son to do it for us. So in our story, we ask God to guide us, and he fulfilled our prayers, greater than we could have ever imagined. We ask God to direct us and help us fill the trailer with supplies for the school, and boy, were there a lot of us at this church praying for that when we first started. And we ended up with a container that when it reached there, it was valued at over $200,000. And the story continued on every step we took. It seemed that the closer that we got to completing God's work, the harder Satan tried to mess things up. 
And that's important to recognize because it tells you that God is making a difference. When we may see God in our time, some believe we may not, but I truly believe we're going to see God in our time. And I do believe that during this walk that we took to Majoral because of our mission, it was with Christ, because it was for Christ, because it was Christ. Satan worked overtime for us to experience frustration and challenge, challenges that at times we thought were insurmountable. But in the end, God brought us through it all. The road we walk is for Christ, and it's not for us. And our character will grow in him to become the person that he desires in us. The road is not always smooth, nor is it always straight. However, it's always passable because Christ placed us on it. He placed you on it. You made that choice, but he put that impulse in you. And in Isaiah 30, 21, your ears shall hear the word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. When you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. I was blessed to have been asked to deliver the baccalaureate speech to our senior class when I was there, and I shared this thought with them. As you travel this road for Jesus, you are going to encounter rough spots, yet he will never leave you. One writer put it this way, the road you travel will not always be straight. There will be curves called failure, loops called confusion, speed bumps called friends, red lights called desires. Caution lights called enemies. You will have flats called jobs, but if you have a spare called determination and an engine called perseverance, and you have insurance called faith, and your driver is Jesus, then you're going to reach God's desired destination for you. In Psalms 32.8, the Bible says, I will instruct you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you and he watches you at night when you sleep. Galatians 6, 9 reads, So let us not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we just don't give up. You know that God doesn't need us to do his work. He's all-powerful and he's in control. Remember, he made the universe in six days. So he can easily fix the problems in this world. But God loves us enough that he gives us choice. And with that choice, he provides the opportunities for us to use the special gifts that he gives us so that we can carry out his work. And when we listen to his call, we are presented with these opportunities to share those gifts. When we choose to listen to his call and we follow his lead and we share the gifts, then we truly see the miracles happen. So for our church here, we are a true testament to tell you that we learned this discipleship from you. Attending this church, the beautiful people here, and how much you give and give and continue giving. How you welcome people in the front door without asking. How you make them feel like family before they leave. There's a huge world out there that needs God's word. If you can't go there, then support those who make their homes in the mission fields for Christ there. May God continue to bless this church and all of its members. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace and your goodness. It is extravagant. I pray today that your people would leave your house with an overwhelming theme that you love them so very much. I pray, Father, that we can realize how truly blessed we are through the most amazing and unconditional love your universe knows. I thank you, Jesus, for loving us, our mistakes, our bad decisions, our inconsistencies, just for loving us as we are. We also ask you, Lord, to watch over our family here at the Arden Hills SDA Church. We thank you, Lord, for blessing all of those who are here today and ask that you continue to provide the strength to their servants' hearts. Each one is so unique and so special to you, and I know you love each one so very much. In God's great name, we give thanks. Amen.